From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Dowsett. I'm Carlos Lozada. I'm Lydia Polgreen. And this is Matter of Opinion. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to try to define America by a cultural objects and artifacts. Does anyone want to explain what this is all about? Sure. Uh, so basically, the editors at New York Times Opinion uh, reached out department-wide and asked everyone to write about a cultural artifact that, in our view, explains the United States of America. Now, is that right? Is that what you guys got out of the assignment? We were given no other pointers. The right. idea is it can be anything. It See, can be a movie. It can be a book. It can be... A song? A song. Could it be like a, a literal object? Like, could it be a Roomba? Could you say, you know, or the Chevy Volt? Ooh. I, I'm just, Chevy I, Volt I, I sort of assumed America. it had to be a work of art, but maybe I read the assignment wrong. This sounds like you didn't actually pay attention to what you were asked to do. Well, they <laughs> sent a lot of emails, and I read, you know, one of them, I guess. I hear that's how you deal with editors. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. I picked The Great Gatsby, mm. which is a book that I imagine a large percentage of our listeners were at least assigned in high school um, or, or afterward, which is probably a better time to read it. It's a slightly odd book, actually, when you think about it, to hand to a 13 or 14-year-old and say, here you go, this is your country. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of ways in which, you know, the reason The Great Gatsby is considered a great American novel is that it sort of is associated with various ideas of what America is. But when I wrote about it, I sort of zeroed in on this idea of that America is a society very much in love with our own innocence, with the idea that we are sort of starting over. There's sort of a blank slate on this new continent. Um, and America also really likes money. We like it. We like it a lot. And reconciling those two impulses, one sort of, you know, religious and idealistic and one crass and just, well, just crass, right, is sort of, you know, a key challenge, a key challenge in our culture. And what's striking about Gatsby is that he's a rich, on-the-make criminal who's, you know, trying to cuckold his neighbor across the water. You know, that doesn't sound like he's the hero of the story, and obviously you can debate about whether Gatsby is technically a hero or not, but I think the book very effectively presents Gatsby as an innocent relative to all of the more sophisticated and worldly figures that he's up against. And in doing that, I think it does this thing that American culture does a lot of, which is America doesn't trust people who have money. But we really like people who are getting money. There's sort of a romance of acquisition in America where the acquisition of money is this sort of both, you know, admirable but also somehow innocent pursuit. And then once people have money, we're like, oh, you're rich and therefore untrustworthy. And this is, I think, one way that we try to reconcile this impulse towards innocence and this sort of reality of acquisition. And we, we love characters who get a lot of money and then sort of lose it instantly in the same way that we love Jay Gatsby. I do think we also have this affection for people who get rich but still cling to kind of like a kid's idea of what rich is. So it's not like Jay Gatsby got all this money and then set himself up as some kind of – some building at Harvard is named after him and he's very erudite and goes to the opera. Like the dude's doing it to get a girl. He buys all these fancy clothes. Yep. He throws all these raging parties. And he's still behaving, you know, like a lot of us when we were kids would be like, oh, my God, if I had all that money, I'd buy me a sports car and just party all the time. But it's also a rejection of, you know, kind of the where America came from, these sort of deep cultural conservatism of the old world, right? And this like remaking of something new and something different that rejects the sort of pomp and circumstance and is really about recreating yourself as something completely different from what came before. Um, I didn't go to high school in the United States, and so I didn't read Gatsby till college. And you know, and I knew it was supposed to be sort of like, you know, the novel. Um, but then I read it this past summer with my kids. 
out loud. We read books together out loud. They're three and five. And so you were, you, were, you, were, you were starting them early. <laughs> they are 15, 12, and now 10. Um, and first of all, it was great to read it out loud because you, you absorb the beauty of Fitzgerald's prose, I think, more, more acutely when you're reading it out loud. But I'm trying to think of the reactions that my kids had to Gatsby. I think that they, um, they, were, more, they were more concerned about Gatsby's greed than taken by his innocence. It seemed much harsher than it had seemed to me on first reading. Um, the kind of brutality of the story, you know, leapt out to, to my children. That's, I mean, they're young, that's a generational divide perhaps, but for them it was a much darker story. Um, Fitzgerald's my favorite author, so like I read Gatsby every 4th of July weekend, as a matter of fact, because it's just so short, you can sit down and do it. And a lot of it is about kind of the brutality of the American myth. I mean, there's a lot of blood and violence and all kinds of ugly things that we still have in our mythology. And I think that your kids have like hit upon an important point there. See, it's it's interesting because, yeah, I, I had sort of the opposite approach from from the Lozada children, which is that as a teenage reader, you know, you, you obviously, you don't read the book and come away thinking, oh, you know, Jay Gatsby, role model for the young, <laughs> right? Things, things obviously end very badly. But I, yeah, I felt this sort of deep affinity for the sort of, you know, the absurd aspirations. And as a reader, I felt like I had to sort of work. I mean, it's all there, all the brutality you're talking about. Michelle, but I, I had to sort of work to become aware of it because I was caught up in the idea that, you know, yes, okay, this was this was a tragedy, but it's a story where the myth and the aspiration is something that I find deeply relatable. So I guess I'm the last, you know, I'm the last true American. <laughs> um, and so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly to Lydia Pole Green. <laughs> Lydia, what is your American artifact? <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned boats because boats actually feature quite prominently in my American artifact. And I feel like mine is a little a little down market, which perhaps is on, on brand for me. Um, I decided to write about Survivor. Um, yeah. It is a reality television show. And I think that the basic structure of it is really well known by now. Um, you have a group of strangers who are thrown together in an exotic locale and with very little to help them, you know, make a life. And the goal is that they're going to essentially create this new society. And over the course of the of the competition, they vote each other off. And the great sort of brilliant twist of the show is at the end, the winner um, is chosen by the people that the contestants have voted off. So it's this kind of brilliant encapsulation of American society in this weird way in that you'd think, okay, these people go to an island and they do all these physical challenges. Therefore, like, big, strong guys are always going to win this competition. But no, the big, strong guys become targets because people talk amongst themselves and they say, that guy is too powerful physically. We need to get rid of him. And they vote him off. Or, because there are all these puzzles and different challenges, there'll be somebody who's like a rocket scientist, and they'll say, well, that guy's definitely going to be awesome at all of the puzzles and challenges, so let's vote him off. That's the sort of the Americanness of the show, is this idea that uh, you win by not drawing too much attention to yourself. And then, at the end, you manage to somehow get the people who you have ejected from the show and deprived of that million-dollar prize to see that you are the savvy, smart person who outwitted them, outplayed them, and outlasted them, but that they can't help but admire for the skill with which you've played the game. Um, so that feels very, I don't know, it feels very American. And I'll confess, I, I started watching it again during the pandemic, in part because I think uh, my wife and I reached the the, the very end of every premium uh, streaming <laughs> streaming service. And so out of desperation, we reached back to this show. But watching these seasons, you really also get this sense of how American society has transformed. And it's not a kind of sanitized version of it. You know, there, there are seasons of Survivor where they literally pit uh, – 
people of different races against one another, right? So there's like, you know, the Asian Americans, the the Latinos, the blacks and the whites. Like explicitly? Explicitly. That's, okay. no, it, it, and so it's, it's in the crudity of how this unfolds that I think you get this like incredible portrait of like how people actually live. Um, it, anyway, it's, a, it's just a fascinating document. And for me as a person who spent a good chunk of my life outside of the United States, and particularly the period that Survivor was on, right? Like, I went abroad in 2004 um, and came back in, you know, 2014, I guess. And so I I missed a lot. And this was a really interesting way to catch up on the things that I missed. Um, Yeah, so Survivor, uh, check it out. I I never saw it. I've never seen a single episode of Survivor, and I didn't know until this moment the kind of built-in retribution of the show, which strikes me as extraordinary, right? It's, it's that, brilliant. That, that the people I, I knew people got voted off the island because getting voted off the island became a became an expression in popular culture outside of the show, and so the notion that that the people who got kicked off first then make the ultimate decision in the show is strikes me as this extraordinary form of vengeance <laughs> um, that that now makes me wish I had seen this and more and feels very American. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you could say it's just a very, very dark critique of democracy itself. That on the one hand, the way Lydia was saying, it's like you you win in a democracy by exploiting everyone else, you know, w- without without actually manifesting your own greatness, right? You're not, you, you know, you need to pretend to be just an ordinary, simple everyman or every woman. And then at a certain point, even though it is apparent that you have exploited everyone, nonetheless, their choice is between two exploiters at the end. And they're just sort of saying, you know, this is the exploiter who who I want to have a beer with, well, right? And it, yeah. And what it, is the, this, this, the first season, right? Had the, the snake and the rat? Say. Yeah, so this, um, there is this legendary moment where... Sue Hawk, who's like the the third runner up, I guess, has to choose between the two final contestants. And um, she gives this stem winder of a speech (laughs) during the tribal council where she basically says, I have to choose between a snake and a rat. But in nature, wow. the snake eats the rat. And so she chose Richard Hatch, who who went on to be, you know, a real supervillain in a lot of different ways. You know, he he was kind of a master manipulator and, you know, on the show, I think very quickly picked up on the strategic possibilities and the ways to be very nasty. But he's also really interesting because, I mean, in this, this show came out in 2000, uh, he was an openly gay man. And uh, one of the other contestants was a former Navy SEAL named Rudy, who uh, was really sort of openly homophobic, who over the course of the season really came to uh, be close with Richard Hatch and and, and admire him. And so that, that's kind of what I mean about this, like, slow social transformation in America, that, you know, it was happening in a way that feels organic and true to the way that we as a society have slowly and inelegantly uh, widened the circle of inclusion. And so it's a really fascinating mirror of those trends. Survivor was a forerunner of a lot of kind of, you know, brutally competitive reality shows, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, there. I think that it really shaped the future of reality television in so many different ways. And, of course, Mark Burnett, who was the executive producer of Survivor, would later create The Apprentice, which was, uh, as we all know— There's no Trump presidency without The Apprentice. <laughs> There's no right. Trump presidency without The Apprentice. No, and so much about—I mean, this is to strengthen Lydia's case— so much about our politics— from Trump onward, is really better explained if you had spent the 2000s watching Survivor, The Real Housewives franchise, and The Apprentice than if you had been, you know, like, most sort of elite journalists watching prestige shows on HBO or something. Absolutely. And I would say that that, that reality television was actually a great kind of— it, it really softened the ground for the antihero is hero, right? Because— it's no fun to watch a reality competition where the nicest guy wins, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's the whole basis for these uh, housewives shows. You know what part you're supposed to play? Oh, you're going to be the nasty one. You're going to be the sweet one. You're going to be the neurotic one. That's, and... that's also how they pitched this show to us. So <laughs> tread, tread, tread carefully, Michelle. I have the memo, Ross. I know who you're supposed to be. <laughs> um, so 
it's absolutely one of those things where the nastiest villains are the most fun to watch. Well, and you're always placing yourself in the game, right? And having your sort of fantasy version of playing Survivor. And that's it's, it's fun to remember that it's fundamentally a game. And who doesn't love games? All right. Let's take a break. And when we come back, Carlos, I want to hear from you. You got it. Hey, Matter of Opinion listeners. Last week, we asked you to send us a voicemail with your summer reading recommendations. If you didn't get to it, it's not too late. Maybe it's a favorite book you reread each year, or it's the new book you're most excited to read on the beach. Tell us what you recommend for a great summer read and why by leaving us a voicemail at 212-556-7440. We may share your recommendation in an upcoming episode. And we're back. Carlos, your turn. Tell us, what defines America for you? Um, I wrote about a series of children's books that I read when I was probably like in the fourth grade um, called The Great Brain. They were stories of the one Catholic family growing up in this small Mormon town, kind of a mining town in Utah. And the author, J.D. Fitzgerald, another Fitzgerald for today, um, is kind of the adoring younger brother in this family who looks up to the middle brother, Tom, known as T.D. Fitzgerald. T.D. had, he had a great brain. He was smarter than all the kids and most of the adults, and he would never stop telling you about it. He also had a money-loving heart. And when you combine a great brain and a money-loving heart, you get the youngest con man in the state of Utah. And for me, T.D. was, was... America. I was, you know, I was like, I was JD. I was the youngest of three in an immigrant family, feeling like outsiders where we were growing up in Northern California. And TD was the model of what this place was supposed to be. He was greedy. Um, he would swindle the kids in town out of their, their money and their possessions. But he would also save the day. He would use his great brain to solve a bank robbery in the town. You know, he would exact vengeance on a really nasty school teacher, Mr. Standish. Um, and so he's always kind of conflicted between his completely self-serving impulses and yet his impulse toward a kind of collective solidarity, which I think is the American dilemma. Um, when the kids in Aidenville finally have enough, you know, they're, they're sick of all the swindles, they're sick of all the tricks TD's pulling, they do the most American thing. They put him on trial. They put him on trial in the Fitzgerald barn. It's in book five. <laughs> of the series. Um, and T.D. realizes for the first time how people felt about him. And he's like, I thought I was just using my great brain to kind of outsmart people, and, but I never, I never realized that it kind of made you hate me. And he tells the judge, who's a kid in high school who wants to go to law school, you know, that I hope that, that the things I've done that you all are, are putting me on trial for can be balanced by the other side of the ledger, the way that I've also helped this community. Um, and I think that's when, – when I read this with my children now, I, I hope that they don't just see the, the hilarious stories, you know, of, of life in, you know, late 19th century Utah. Uh, I hope they also see that T.D.'s dilemma is, is theirs, is, is the nation's dilemma. And um, somehow when this assignment came up in my email, I, I instantaneously knew I had to write about the great brain. That is a tremendous choice because those I, I read those books as a kid. Those books are amazing. Uh, I actually just got two of them for our <laughs> oldest daughter, who <laughs> wow. proceeded to swindle me out of you know something. I think in the in the course of the transaction. Um, but I don't have a lot to add except a, a strong endorsement, and also to note that between you know Jay Gatsby. Richard Hatch and T. D. Fitzgerald, <laughs> we have established a clear pattern that. They're not all con artists exactly, but the idea of, like, the confidence man, you know, the figure who is swindling you, but you like them in some way, you're sympathetic to what they're doing, like, that just seems really, really American. And obviously, TD is a more sympathetic version than the once and future president of the United States, Donald Trump. But I think if we had... 
Donald Trump on this podcast and put him on trial, he would want to talk about all the good things that he did, <laughs> too. You know, book six of the Great Brain series ends with J.D., the younger brother, saying, you know, I'm sure that someday our family will either visit Tom in the White House or in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and why not or both? Exactly. Yeah. Why choose? Uh, Yes. I like that, though, as a message for kids, because I do think one thing that is important is to get the message across early that people are complicated. They're not all good or all bad. And this is something that, uh, you know, like grownups have a real problem with, especially in my field when you're covering politics, the idea that they're not just these one dimensional villains that aren't on your side, that there is something redeeming in people even that you have real problems with. So I actually kind of like that these are complicated characters. You know, one of the driving stories and questions of the whole series is, will TD finally, like, make good? Will he Will he end up being a good guy, you know? And, and book five is called The Great Brain Reforms. Um, but I love that it starts when Utah officially joins the nation, right, mm. as a state, because I felt that it was like TD stepping in and kind of like making this whole place his. Yeah, yeah. All right, that was me and the great brain. Michelle, take us home. All right. See, I'm not going for an anti-hero or anybody, you know, super controversial. I wanted to pick something or rather someone who represents the sunny and optimistic version of America. And now I grew up in the South, so I had to go with Dolly Parton. Musical legend. Legend. So most basically, she is the embodiment of the American dream. Smart, savvy, self-made. She's got one of those scrappy, up-from-nothing backstories that America just loves to tell about itself. And then she transformed herself into this over-the-top character with these towering platinum wigs and costumes and lots of fringe and spangles. She went all in on the extremely American idea that bigger's better, whether you're talking about boobs or hair. <laughs> and in that one way, she's like Donald Trump, but in no other. She's not aggrieved or defensive. She doesn't make anyone feel less than her. Her work speaks to the people who, like, feel they don't fit in. I mean, she's long been this towering queer icon, and she mostly aims to be largely apolitical. And she finds, you know, partisan squabbling. She, she doesn't like that, which is really what most Americans think about partisan squabbling. But she casts it as like this matter of down-home common sense and decency. Like when she took the word Dixie out of the name of one of her supper theaters, she's like, you know, as soon as you realize there's a problem, you need to fix it, quote, you know, don't be a dumbass. So... And in the heat of the vaccine wars, she made a video of herself getting the shot and singing this pro-vaccine ditty to the tune of, like, her hit song, Jolene. And I'm going to butcher this, but I was like, <laughs> yes. She went like, vaccine, 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 vaccine. I'm begging of you, please don't hesitate. All right, so fine. So, Talk okay. Well. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> what? Ross. So I, don't you be, I, I, don't you be I, hating on her. So I'm no. I mean, I'm. You, you have created this intense internal conflict in me because I, I agree with everything you said about Dolly, except that I thought all vaccine-related pop culture kitsch was horrible. But then I was so impressed by your rendition. See, see. So I'm I like, I'm torn. Mind. I'm torn. I'm torn Mission in so many directions at once. But, you know, culturally, she's a red state phenomenon, but the last several years, blue state America has fallen totally in love with her, like prompting all these stories about how she's become a living saint. And, you know, I don't think we need to go that far, but she is the best version of America, you know, like America as it fancies itself to be. You know, it's funny, I um, when when doing this project, I almost pitched writing about Dolly Parton, but from a very different angle. And that angle was that Country music, I believe, is the sort of universal music, just like Bollywood cinema is the universal cinema. Like, it just, it taps into sort of like the core atomic unit of human feeling. And I have seen Dolly Parton's songs performed in countries all around the world in the most random, random situations. I mean, you you know, it, at a refugee camp, you know, a band comes together and is, is playing Jolene or... 
And so, so I think I think that there is something not just American, but kind of like universally just wonderful about Dolly Parton and about country music in general, but specifically about Dolly Parton. And I do think that her ability to couch the things that she believes and the things that she cares about as common sense is also like really, really deeply American. And we have a lot of conversations and arguments and debates about political correctness and, you know, what you can and can't say. But I think a lot of these disputes are really just about what we used to call manners, um, you know, that you call people by the name that they asked to be called um, and you treat people with respect. And, you know, manners can be used in lots of different ways. They can also be used to enforce social codes and, and keep change from happening. But it's good to be reminded by a figure like Dolly Parton of what really matters in how we treat one another and what we celebrate. I love the sort of serendipitous order in which we discuss these because if if the great Gatsby and Survivor and the Great Brain do such a good job of capturing the tensions of America, which is I think why we chose them, um, Dolly Parton is an example of what can try to unite America and try to not pretend those tensions don't exist, but kind of put them in their proper perspective and place. And we got to hear Michelle sing. I'm going to be here all week, folks. Like, tip your waiters. Tip your waiters. All right, folks, let's take another break. And when we're back, Lydia has this week's hot cold. And we're back. Lydia, what's your hot cold? It's actually a combination of something I'm very hot on and also another thing that I'm extremely cold on, but they're related. Um, So I have been reading a book. It's called Paved Paradise. It's by oh, it's really good. a journalist sorry, named, sorry, sorry, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. named Henry Graeber. Oh, that's okay. I, I love the enthusiasm, Carlos. Um, and it's a book about parking, which does not necessarily sound like, you know, a page turner. But um, what I realized reading this book was just how much parking is ruining our lives and ruining America. Um, it's full of amazing facts about uh, how much space parking takes up, how many resources parking takes up. Um, there are things like we build more three-car garages than one-bedroom apartments. Every car spends 95% of its lifespan parked. There are also funny anecdotes, like there was a man in Park City, Utah, who called 911 because he couldn't find a parking space. Um, I mean, we've all been there. You know, it's it's frustrating. Um, and no one, no one is immune to, to coveting parking. Apparently, Mother Teresa asked uh, City Hall to dedicate two parking spots uh, for uh, her and her sisters at uh, the AIDS hospice that she had in the West Village. So it turns out that parking is a huge, powerful force that uh, we don't think about that much that is actually ruining our lives. So I am very pro this book, uh, Very Hot on Paved Paradise by Henry Graybar. And I am very down on parking. My family recently moved back from the suburbs to D.C. proper, and our house comes with parking. But, of course, people are always parking in our parking places. And so I will just stand at my back door and (laughs) glare at their cars and imagine all the things I'm going to throw at them and... If they happen to come out while I'm outside, I'm like, you, you cannot park there. That is my parking space. And and to that, I say quad era demonstratum. I mean, (laughs) you've you've proved the point of the book right there. (laughs) I am not ashamed to admit it. I, I will I will only say that any critique of parking for those of us with uh somewhat substantial numbers of children under the age of 12 has to come with some kind of minivan carve out. Because all theories, <laughs> all theories of the carless utopia where the car is only there and the 5% of the time when you actually need it and so on have to reckon with the reality that when you have a lot of kids, your minivan is effectively an extension of your home, a sort of mobile representative storage unit. filled an essential storage unit. The only way you can possibly go certain places and do certain things. And so while I accept the critique, it still is the case that 
I got to park my minivan somewhere. <laughs> Ross, uh, we're a Toyota Sienna family. What are you? Yeah, we're we're a C, we're Siennas. Yeah. No, we're yeah. Honda. It it will it will uh, it will surprise no one that I drive a Subaru Outback. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, Lydia. <laughs> Living up to the cliche. I'm not taking that bait. Just not. Thanks for listening. We shared our cultural artifacts on today's episode. If you want to read what other New York Times columnists selected for their cultural artifacts, go to nytimes.com slash cultural artifacts. Matter of Opinion is produced by Derek Arthur, Phoebe Lett, and Sophia Alvarez Boyd. It is edited by Stephanie Joyce. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Efim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. Hold up. 